Good morning. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Truly, and with me today is Peter. How are we doing, Peter? Uh, hello. Everything's all right. I can hear you, and I'm very glad to be with you here online. Well, uh, Peter Pashkoff is uh, very fascinating to me, and it's because he is translating the entirety of the Acts of the Council of Florence, which is not something a lot of scholars are doing. Granted, this will be in the Russian language, but it makes uh, Peter one of the premier experts on this issue, and it's a very important issue. But before we dive into that, can you tell us briefly who you are and your background? Uh, well, uh, so uh, as Craig uh, has already said, my name is Peter Fashkov. I'm an Orthodox Christian, Russian. I live in Moscow. I graduated with a master's degree in classics uh, in Moscow State University and then went to the Orthodox uh, St. Tichon's University in Moscow too, to write my dissertation about the Council of Ferrara Florence. Uh, I'm married and I have one daughter. You can hear her. Uh, maybe on the background. Uh, well, she's uh, three years old. <laughs> so, so that's it. And I think that she wants to be a fast car. <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> My wife's gonna love that. <laughs> she's welcome, queen. Peter's family. There's the whole family. What a delightful family. <laughs> <laughs> so, well. Uh, here we are. But uh, she's going for a walk now, so we'll be uh, we'll be broadcasting without her, and it may be better. Oh well, it's like it. Craig. Hello. We're having uh, some technical difficulties for the moment. Oh, yes. Um, no, again, no, this when, right. from Russia, uh, you could get some of this when you're doing that online. So let's just wait a moment until Peter reappears, and we're gonna try yes. maybe uh, taking the cameras off for a second. Peter, do you do you hear me? Yes, I hear. You. Now I'm Peter. here. Now I can hear you. All, yes. Alrighty, so. So we will uh, we will see if the camera thing improves matters, and I'll just make myself bigger for the moment. So, Peter, tell us about uh, who you are. You teach at Moscow Theological um, Academy. Am I getting that right? It's uh, not an academy. It's uh, Saint Tichon's Orthodox University. Uh, it's uh, well, but it uh, it's a theological university. Yes, uh, uh, but uh, it also has. Uh, philological uh, department, historical department, and so on. So, and I'm, where, and where do you teach? Who do you teach at that university? Uh, well, um, currently I am teaching Byzantine literature and church history. So I am teaching future church historians and uh, well, church philologists, so to say. All right, and what got you interested into studying the classics and then getting to uh, church history specifically? Well, uh, you see, uh, uh, it was some kind of personal interest. Uh, I started studying classics because my spiritual father blessed me to go and study classics. I wanted to be a philologist, but he uh, told me that uh, classics is uh, the best thing, uh, the best thing to study. And uh, well, I studied classics, uh, but soon I decided to turn to early church fathers like uh, Basil the Great, like Gregory the Theologian, because well, uh, they were some kind of uh, Christian classicists, yes, uh, some kind of Christian antiquity. And uh, then from, uh, from early church fathers, I, uh, well, I went to Byzantine fathers, to Mark of Ephesus, to Gregory Palamas, and so on. So that was And good. so to, to be an expert in the classics, I presume you're fully literate in Russian, because you're Russian, English, because you're speaking in English, Greek, Latin, any other languages? Uh, yes, a bit of German, uh, a bit of Italian, uh, well, a, a, and uh, New Greek, uh, you know, ancient Greek and New Greek uh, are different languages, and a little bit of Hebrew, 
uh, of uh, ancient Hebrew, but a very little bit. Well, well that's all. A and a, a bit of French, but uh, it's so, so bad uh, that uh, almost not true. Pretty much you could order coffee if you have to. <laughs> yes. There you go. Well, that, that's, that's, that's not bad. It's, uh, so that being said, let me ask this question very frankly. Russia barely has any Roman Catholics. So why does anyone there care about the Council of Florence that you're researching it? What motivated you? Well, uh, first of all, Russia has a few Roman Catholics, but still they do exist. Even Russian units do. You know, and several of Russian religious philosophers of the turn of 19th, uh, 20th centuries, like Solovyov, like Sergei Bulgakov, had unique tendencies. I think you know. Mm -hmm. mm, well, and uh, Russian Catholics are sometimes very active in their missionary efforts. So, so they evangelize the Orthodox. Yes, yes, and uh, well, it was more of a problem earlier, like in the end of uh, 19th, uh, yes, but now it is a problem too. And Catholics, uh, well, sometimes we just need to have an answer to the apology, which is often based on the Council of Florence. It is, well, like cornerstone of their identity, so to say. Uh, but it's not the only reason, of course. Uh, you know, uh, Council of Florence is some kind of um, central, critical event for the history of Christian world as a whole, not only of the Catholics, but for the Orthodox too. And, um, well, arguing with Russian units sparked my interest in the Council of Florence. But um, this is a dramatic final of the Byzantine history, a truly epic final act. And, and so on. Yes. Very well said, because I, I agree with you that so much of the Roman Catholic position is bound to what occurred at the Council of Florence because it's dogmatic for them and it literally has representation from the Orthodox side where there's no reversing from their positions the, the Council of Florence without admitting they were wrong. You know, yes. so you have to either affirm it or say that it's wrong. And so what we'll bring up today is what really occurred there so that my viewers, English language viewers, could decide for themselves whether they're going to affirm what the Roman Catholic side represented the Council of Florence or they're going to deny it because there's can only be one or the other. Yes. So, yes. Before, the, so before we get into that, being that you're translating the minutes, let me ask you, what are the sources of the Council's minutes and how long are these minutes? Uh, well, uh, there are three primary sources uh, on the Council of Florence, so-called Acta Greca, so-called Acta Latina, and the mem memoirs of uh, Sylvester Siropoulos, yes? Yes. Uh, well, um, and a lot of minor texts from different participants, uh, but, uh, well, they are minor sure. still. Um, and. Uh, I said so-called because technically neither Acta Greca, neither Acta Lat nor Acta Latina are pure council meeting minutes. Yes, Acta Greca is a compilation. It includes consular minutes uh, itself. Uh, this, uh, well, the speeches from the council written down by uh, by stenographers, uh, and some fragments from the description of the council written by Metropolitan Dorotheos of Mytilini. Well, uh, the uh, so-called Acta Latina is uh, a paraphrase of um, retelling of the minutes composed by papal advocate Andrea de Santa Croce. Uh, they are preserved in only two manuscripts and in a pretty awful Latin, uh, but uh, so it's not uh, Latin minutes at all. That to, to, to be uh, to, to be honest, it is a paraphrase, not uh, not uh, consular minutes. Well, yes. So the, uh, these are our sources. Uh, now you made mention in the memoirs, and I want to ask you: Do the contents of these memoirs always agree in detail um, with the minutes? So let's like the recollections of Basil Bessarion or Sylvester Seropolis. 
how accurate are those sources? Where do they disagree? Where do they agree? Well, um, the members of Seropoulos uh, are not concerned with uh, what happened on public sessions. Uh, well, he devotes less than 10% of his texts uh, to the uh, to the consider minutes itself itself so uh, well they just can't contradict each other because uh, they uh, are concerned with different things uh, Siropoulos uh, tells us about uh, backstage discussions about intrigues about debates about internal strife uh, in the Greek delegation itself while uh, Acta Latina and Acta Greca uh, tell us about what happened in the public sessions. Uh, so, well, they have a uh, few points uh, where they can cross. But uh, Acta Greca includes uh, fragments of uh, the book called Description of the Council of Florence. This book is not preserved entirely. It exists only in these fragments, which are included in Acta Greca. Uh, and it was written by Dorotheus of Mytilini, and uh, this book, well, it has, uh, it describes uh, some of the events described by Seropoulos too. Uh, but the problem is that we don't have it uh, entirely. We have only fragments of it, so we can be sure what exactly was said there when the book was whole, as you may understand. Now, would you, just to clarify, is uh, Serapolis's are his memoirs the the most concise and important source we have for those vaccine discussions, or is there any other sources that could compete with it in matter of uh, importance? Yes, what I wanted to say is that uh, on the backstage uh, discussions, yes, Aeropolis is the main source, and well, the only complete source, so to say. Only complete source, very good. Only complete source, yes, yes. Uh, the descriptions uh, are too short, are too fragmentary, and well, uh, you see, these fragments were collected and prepared for the edition, so to say, by John Joseph Plusiadinus. Uh, he was an innate apologist and he wrote after the memoirs of uh, Seropoulos were finished. So you see, he, he wrote, he complied, he took these fragments exactly for uh, refuting Seropoulos, so to say. Now, for those in the audience that are not aware, Sylvester Seropoulos, um, he became a union and then repented and joined the Orthodox side and Basil Basarian apostatized and uh, became a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. And yeah. so I'm going to pose you the question, but there's going to be some bias, at least perceived, due to us both being Orthodox. Um, who is more reliable when it comes to recollecting what occurred during this actual council, Basil Bessarion or Sylvester Sovaropoulos, and why do you think that is? Well, um, you see, uh, Bessarion uh, left no, well, complete, long uh, description of what happened. Yes, he has only brief remarks in his longer theological uh, texts. So, well, is he reliable? Uh, sometimes he is reliable, possibly, well, when he, is, uh, when he describes uh, the early stages of uh, the council in Ferrara, when he says that early speeches from Catholic uh, speakers were awful, were weak, and Greeks uh, thought that uh, they will easily win the day, for example. Yes, I think he is completely reliable, uh, it's true. Uh, but when we are speaking about uh, the backstage things, well, I think Syropoulos is reliable, but we have always to be a bit careful because, well, He's an anti-unionist, he's an orthodox, and he may sometimes be, well, too suspicious of uh, his opponents. So, well, he thinks they were more, uh, well, he thinks they were worse than they were in truth, I think, yes. For example, he says that uh, Pope uh, tried to, to starve orthodox, to leave them without money, but it was not uh, something of policy of Pope. He just didn't have money, for example. Papal treasury was empty. Just an example. 
so well, Seropolis is reliable, but we have to take right. him as everything. But so essentially, what makes Seropolis important is just simply how much information he has, how complete that source is, and he's the only person who was there with such a complete source. So that's pretty much all the historian has to work with if they want that much detail, and they depend upon Serapolis. One, one more question on this point. Is there anything in the Greek or Latin minutes that disagree with either Bessarion or Serapolis or any other memoir or recollection? Well, um, I think that uh, there is no uh, obvious contradiction uh, just because uh, they were concerned with, devoted to different things. But uh, still, for example, how one evaluates uh, what happened, uh, what, um, like uh, Bessarion says, that uh, the argumentation of uh, Giuliano Cesarini, uh, cardinal uh, and opponent of uh, St. Mark of Ephesus during the last sessions in Ferrara, uh, was strong, was, uh, uh, was invincible, was brilliant, and so on. Well, uh, this obviously contradicts uh, the truth because it was based on forgeries uh, and he used spurious texts. What well, St. Mark uh, pointed at this, but Bessarion just uh, doesn't tell us about it. He just keeps silent. So there, are, there is no obvious contradictions, but uh, there are subtle differences. I, So the sources don't contradict. The real issue is the accuracy of their interpretations. Yes, I think so. Okay. All right. So that being said, let me ask this. Are there any marked differences between the Greek and Latin minutes? Yes, uh, there are. Uh, you see, Greek minutes are, well, through minutes of the council. Yes, uh, there are speeches written down by secretaries, of course. But uh, on the other hand, uh, hand uh, they're incomplete. They, uh, for example, for Ferrara, for the first part of the council, uh, they do not contain last three sessions. Uh, there were 13 public sessions with uh, theological discussions. And sessions 11th, uh, 12th, and 13th, uh, they are just not included in the Greek minutes. Mm, well, uh, why is that, by the way? Uh, well, uh, you see, we don't know the exact reasoning, but uh, several times uh, Greek notaries, stenographers who wrote down the speeches, left their notes. Uh, like in the end of the seventh session, they say, and then uh, the Latin speaker, it was our Archbishop Andrew of Rhodes. Uh, started playing for time, uh, talking nonsense, and we decided that his uh, speech does not deserve to be written down. And they didn't uh, write it down just because it was crap. Uh, sorry. Well, essentially, and, uh, so who is you're saying the in the Greek, the Greeks made a poor showing those final three sessions, so they just didn't they didn't record it or they lost those minutes, so to say. I think they, I think they, they deemed uh, those uh, last three sessions uh, well, pointless, valueless, uh, not worthy of writing down. Perhaps uh, it is only uh, well. I can only guess. We can only guess because uh, possibly it was just lost or, or destroyed, uh, destroyed with an intention. Because well. For example, because of the harsh and uncompromising tone of these last three sessions when uh, St. Mark of Ephesus and uh, Cardinal Giuliano Cesarini were arguing and, well, they were very harsh, they were angry uh, at times, maybe it was the reason. But and so, so this was in Florence or in Ferrara? In Ferrara, in Ferrara. In Ferrara, Ferrara, okay. The last, last three Ferrara our own sessions. I, I have just finished translating it, well, just yesterday, uh, to be honest, uh, I finished my translational work of the first half of the council, of the Ferraran part. Uh, I have not yet moved to Florence, so to say. I have read it, of course, but not translated. And, now, uh, 
And latent acts by Santa Croce, well, it contains everything. It is our only complete uh, source on what happened uh, in council. But, uh, well, yes. So how are the Latin minutes incomplete? They are complete. They are complete, but uh, they are not uh, minutes. Yes, it is a complete paraphrase of everything. So there were latent minutes, latent speech, uh, speeches written down and translated into latent. Then uh, the minutes itself were lost sometime before 16th century, it seems, because in, in the 16th century, um, uh, the scholars first tried to find them. They do not exist. But this paraphrase called Acta Latina, uh, it does exist and it contains everything and it is, well, reliable enough uh, to use it as a source about everything what happened. It just contains all the speeches, everything that was said, but it is uh, complied by the papal advocate Andrea de Santa Croce. And so you're saying that the Acta Latina is a, just a translation of the Greek into Latin? No, it's not a translation from Greek into Latin. It is a paraphrase of Latin uh, stenogram. You know, oh, okay. there were the speeches were written down in both languages in uh, greek and in latin they were translated there in council during sessions because well greek uh, speakers didn't know latin latin speakers didn't know greek and they uh, had translators there in council and speeches were written down in two languages and the latin version was paraphrased by papal advocate and so then the Latin we have now is not the original Latin myths, but a paraphrase of them. And that's what makes it less yeah. authoritative than what we have with the Greek, which is the original Greek minutes. Yes, yes. But uh, still, it has uh, the sessions we don't have in Greek. So, uh, well, something you get, something you lose, so to say. Is there anything in, the, in that Latin paraphrase that's missing the Greek that's particularly important? Yes, yes. Uh, as I said, these uh, three last sessions, uh, they are the most important of uh, Ferrara sessions. Uh, Florentine sessions is another thing, but from Ferrara, the last three sessions are really the most important. It was some kind of duel, so to say, between St. Mark and uh, Cardinal Cesarini. And uh, it is very interesting. Both sides uh, used their best uh, reasoning, best arguments. Uh, well, uh, it was the part when St. Mark, uh, well, was the primary, the main uh, speaker from the Orthodox side before Bessarion said nearly half of the speeches. Uh, so, so in short, what were, they, are, what were they, what was the topic of argument in those last three sessions? Uh, it was the addition to the creed. Uh, well, you see, okay. uh, the discussion as a whole was di divided into dogma and the question of the creed. And uh, the creed was uh, the topic discussed in Ferrara. So let me ask qu uh, quickly, um, what indications are there that the minutes are fairly reliable in recording what was discussed? Like, so for example, when you read Chalcedon, it, it's so reliable the minutes even record them collating the minutes like this like their side conversation is recorded into the minutes um you read some other councils like for example the council of nicaea too it's pretty much it was almost like the minutes were written after the council was really done it's almost more of a paraphrase so with the council of florence what indications do we have that the minutes were reliable and were really recording what was discussed during this council well, uh, first of all, uh, we see it, well, just in what is transcribed. If it was complied after the council, uh, the annoyed, the angry phrases from both sides will not just make it to the text. You know, when St. Mark just gets interrupted by his opponents, they call him names, they insult him, for example. Uh, there are such uh, cases when, like, uh, Cardinal Cesarini says, you are not polite enough, maybe it's because I am too strong on you, because uh, I'm, uh, and St. Mark answers, 
the only thing you are attacking strongly is the truth. You are attacking strongly the truth. Uh, well, such things would not make to the final text. Oh. Well. Hello? Do you hear me? I'm here. It's just you're breaking up yeah. a little bit. And uh, so we'll see if that fixes things with the camera off. Let me ask this. Um, are there any discussions that we know occurred, but they're not recorded in the minutes? Whether Seropolis talks about them or the minutes dis even say something was discussed, but it's just not recorded. Um, do we have any evidence of something like that? Uh, well, uh, there are there are things that were uh, recorded by Seropolis from the a couple of first sessions. He mentions uh, like one or two phrases uh, from both sides, uh, but mostly everything is transcribed uh, either in uh, Acta Greca or if Acta Greca does not contain something, uh, the uh, Acta Latina helps. Uh, yes, it contains everything. So yeah, so these minutes do appear very reliable. Let yes, me yes. ask. Let me ask this: How was? Um, well, actually, no. I'm getting ahead of myself. Now this is going to be tough, but we're going to try our best to do this so that way people could walk away from this and they just have this one clip. They have a good overall idea of what occurred in this council. Can you give a brief review, maybe in a sentence or two, for each session of the council? Well, I'll try, but it, it may be it may be not a task. So I beg your pardon in forward. So well, the council was opened by uh, uh, by a session uh, in which Cardinal Bisserian, uh, well, he uh, proposed speech. He uh, said about well how great the council. So uh, what a good thing uh, uh, unity is, and so on. Yes, it was, uh, well, like a honorary Whoa. session. The Whoa. second session Whoa. was, uh, the second session was devoted uh, to the organizational questions. The third session was the first proper concilia discussion. Uh, it was started by St. Mark of Ephesus. Uh, and uh, his speech was excellent. It was an excellent speech about love being charity, being uh, the foundational principle of the church, uh, and about councils being, well, practical implementation of this charity, because council, when uh, all the brothers are discussing uh, discuss questions of dogma together, is just uh, an act of love and charity from every side. It is a great and a very beautiful speech. Uh, I hope I'll translate it into English sometime soon because it's great. Uh, the, I look forward to that. <laughs> second session, uh, the second public session, yes, uh, from now I will, I will count them from the first one. Um, uh, then uh, St. Mark of Ephesus tried to uh, read aloud uh, the definitions of the ecumenical councils uh, about the creed being unchangeable. You know, yes, uh, the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon uh, define that the creed cannot be changed by uh, anyone uh, and latents change the creed and it was the first topic of discussion. But Latins uh, just tried to stop him and not let him read uh, these definitions because there were lots of people there, uh, monks, lay people from Ferrara, and Latin theologians just played for time. They just didn't let him to read the definitions on the second session. It was uh, a scandalous session, well, uh, and unpleasant reading, so to say. He, uh, St. Mark starts talking, he gets interrupted, uh, they start arguing it's awful the third session uh it was the session when saint mark managed to read uh, the definitions of the ecumenical councils but uh, laity and monks were blocked they were not permitted to be there on the session on the third session so saint mark uh, read the definitions on the fourth sessions uh for fourth session uh uh, Archbishop Andrew of Rhodes, the main speaker for the Latin side 
uh, during the first half uh, of Ferraran sessions, comes up and starts answering to Saint Mark. He starts refuting uh, his concealer readings. And fourth session and fifth session are wholly uh, well taken by uh, Andrew Afrolis. He just talks and talks endlessly. Uh, when then he goes off topic, he starts discussing dogma. Uh, Saint Mark and Bessarion try to correct him, try to remind him of the topic of the discussion, but he just ignores them and keeps talking and talking and talking for, for two days uh, in a row. Later, uh, sessions six and seven, uh, uh, it was the answer by Bessarion to Andrew Frodus. It was much shorter, it is two sessions too, but these sessions are much shorter than the previous ones. Uh, and this speech by Bessarion was probably written, uh, well, not only by Bessarion, but, but by Bessarion and Salarius, uh, Saint Gennadius Salarius together. Uh, they, uh, so that, yeah, yes, uh, this is the answer to Andrew of Rhodes, and it was so persuasive, so strong, so to say, that uh, Leighton's did not know want to answer, what to answer, what to answer, and uh, started changing their speakers. First, Andrew of Rhodes tried to answer something, then uh, Archbishop uh, Aloisio da Pirano, from uh, for Lee, I don't know how it is called in English. Uh, he tried to answer too, and the answers were very, very weak. Uh, but uh, the eighth, eighth of the same, uh, session was devoted to the latent trying to answer to the Saran, but it was not very persuasive and not very successful. Uh, the ninth session. Uh, was uh, the beginning of the discussion between Cardinal Cesarini and uh, St. Mark of Ephesus. They started discussing, uh, uh, well, like their duel, so to say, uh, and it was 9th, 10th, uh, 11th, 12th, and 13th sessions when they uh, were arguing about the creed. Uh, St. Mark proposed uh, some arguments. Uh, I don't know, well, do I need to retell them? It will be too long, maybe. Uh, I'll just say that they were arguing about the creed, and, well, uh, late inside used several... Peter, and if you can, you might have to turn your camera off, because you're breaking up so much. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, now it must be better. Yes? Oh, all right. Uh, so, well, the late insight used several false and spurious texts. Um, well, so, so Peter, if I can it. interrupt, I heard yeah. argument nine eleven. You talked about sessions nine eleven, where they're arguing about the creed. Could we just get a review seven eight seven and eight before going to twelve? Uh, yes, of course. Seven and eight. Yes. Uh, so, the seventh uh, session. Uh, was uh, also part of Bessarion's answer to the Latins. Uh, well, his speech, written together with uh, Scalarius, was very persuasive, very strong, and in the end of the seventh session, the Latins um, came together to the Pope and discussed their tactics uh, for the answer. It was very interesting. Uh, Andrea de Santa Croce tells us uh, this, uh, it is a very valuable insight, you know, that they didn't know what to answer and needed to discuss it among themselves. Uh, later then, on the eighth uh, session, uh, Leighton's changed their speaker from uh, Andrew of Rhodes. They sent uh, Archbishop Aloisio de Pirano from Forlì uh, to speak for the latent position. He was uh, a Franciscan monk uh, prior to his consecration into a bishop. And, well, he was a good uh, trained scholastic in the best traditions of the Western Church. So he was arguing, reasoning uh, scholastically. It was 
uh, well, a bit strange, I think, because not that uh, Celestic, uh, being Celestic is bad, but his reasoning was weird a bit. But still, uh, still he was. And uh, it was the eighth session and the beginning of the ninth. And then uh, Cardinal Cesarini, uh, well, uh, took the, uh, took the, so to say, and started arguing with uh, St. Mark Ephesus, and it was till the end of Ferrara. Uh, so it is the brief overview, brief review of the Ferrara sessions. Uh, well, do you want me to continue to the Florence, or you have some questions? Please. I, I will just ask one question about Ferrara before we go to Florence, which is, were there any decrees made then, or was that too early in the council for the council to issue decrees? Uh, no, no. All the uh, all the issues, all the um, conciliar uh, uh, decrees were issued on uh, only in Florence, in the end of the council as a whole. The only decree produced in Ferrara was a decree of translation into Florence. Uh, well, it is not very interesting. <laughs> right, so uh, they moved to Florence, and what was discussed in Florence starting with session one? Uh, in Florence, they were discussing dogma. They were discussing dogma. They were discussing uh, the teaching uh, about uh, well, from whom the Holy Spirit proceeds, from Father alone or from Father and the Son. Uh, well, uh, since I haven't yet translated uh, the, um, the Florentine sessions, I will be more brief uh, here. Uh, they discussed uh, dogma. Uh, the main speakers were Saint Mark of Ephesus and, uh, well, and uh, John de Montenero, uh, Giovanni Montenero. Uh, he was a Dominican uh, theologian from the uh, order of, of preachers. Uh, well, and the discussion. Uh, I think that it has to be discussed in detail. Uh, I hope, well, we'll be able to discuss it later. But, well, they discussed several uh, texts of the Fathers, uh, for example, uh, from Basil of the Great and his book uh, Contra Evnomium, uh, and from Saint Maximus the Confessor, uh, yes, his uh, epistle to Marinus, uh, and some other texts. Uh, mostly it was about the uh, about uh, patristic uh, quotations. Later, Saint Mark of Ephesus um, understood that discussion is pointless because Latins are not listening, just not listening, only speaking, and uh, he stopped attending uh, conciliar sessions. Just he said he was ill, and he was probably he was ill really, and he stopped going to the conciliar sessions. And in the end, uh, Giovanni spoke alone, presented uh, the latent position alone without anyone to oppose him. It was very interesting when uh, Isidor, uh, Isidor, uh, the Metropolitan of Kiev, uh, said he was group too, yes. Uh, he said that, uh, you, you, do you think that you have won? It is easy to, to win when uh, there is no opponent. Oh, and if uh, only one person runs, uh, he will be the champion, of course. But uh, still, uh, still after this presentation, uh, the public sessions ended and started backstage discussions among the Greeks uh, themselves because the emperor wanted, uh, well, he wanted union. He needed union to protect the city, to protect the empire. Uh, and he saw that public discussions lead to nothing because neither Greeks are convinced by Latins, neither the Latins are convinced by the Greek. And so, Backstage discussions uh, lead, uh, they tried to invent some compromise. They didn't succeed in it. And uh, well, uh, then Bessarion and uh, Isidor and the, the Emperor's Confessions, Gregory Mamas, decided that uh, they need union. They need union and they uh, turned to protect, to defend the latent position and uh, led uh, the rest of the delegation to the union, to sub subscription of the union. I think we'll uh, discuss it in detail uh, well, further. So that's it.
All right, so let me ask you this. In this council, in what way did they speak of the fathers vis-a-vis -vis syllogisms, right? You were making note of how they were speaking of scholasticism. Uh, the Latin uh, guy who took over in Ferrara was making scholastic arguments. Uh, were scholastic arguments what decided this council, or was an appeal to the fathers what decided this council? Well, uh, patristic authority was, of course, uh, the most authoritative uh, during the council, of course. Yes, it was the chief means of discerning the of, of, of uh, doctrine, of course. But, uh, and in this respect, both sides were similar. Mostly they used patristic authorities and quotations, but also sometimes resorted uh, to syllogisms. St. Mark had uh, a whole set of syllogisms, so-called syllogistic chapters uh, against the Latins, uh, prepared to use in the discussion. And he used several of them, both in the discussion of creed and uh, in the discussion of dogma. Uh, well, as St. Gregory Palamas said in his letter to Akindinus, uh, for the use of syllogi uh, syllogisms uh, in matters of faith, uh, we will not blame the Latins because we learned uh, we have learned it by experience from the fathers. But uh, but uh, patristic authority was more important, more important, and in the end, it was uh, the quotations from Latin church fathers that convinced uh, convinced Greeks to subscri subscribe uh, the union to accept the union. Uh, well, uh, Bessarion just presented a whole lot of quotations. Some of them, some of them were false and spurious, but he didn't know it. Like dozens of quotations from Western Church Fathers, like Augustine, like Ambrose, like uh, others, and said, "Do you think all those fathers can be in error?" And uh, the uh, the Greek bishops just agreed and said, "Oh yes, if." they say so, uh, well, we have to accept this teaching. So, yes, it was mostly patristic authorities, mo mostly patristic quotations. By the way... So, so let me just clarify. So, the Greek side was largely convinced by the witness of uniformity from Western Latin fathers in favor of the filioque. They weren't dismissive of the Latin fathers. They actually held them great esteem. But yes. we now know in retrospect they were being posed with false passages from these Western fathers. Is this what you're contending? Yes, yes, uh, exactly what I wanted to say. The Greeks were convinced by uh, the seemingly unanimous authority of Western fathers in favor of Philoque, uh, and they thought that uh, if Western fathers are so clear, so, well, so clearly uh, from this teaching, the Greek fathers just can't disagree, and so it must be a patristic teaching. Uh, but so, now we know it was not the case. It was not the case because, well, we know fathers better than them. And so just just to make a comment or aside, though you're the expert, but I'm not sure how much you're aware in at least English language apologetics in the West, there's a trope that the, the Orthodox East was um, myopic and ethnocentric and discounted Western fathers. And what you're demonstrating to us through your knowledge of this council is that the opposite is the case. That they actually held these Western fathers in esteem. And it was because of this esteem that when they were convinced falsely of the authority of, uh, of these spurious passages, that then they reinterpreted Greek fathers to be in line with these Latin fathers. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly, and uh, well, they held uh, Latin fathers in the same esteem as the Greek ones, they just read them less, uh, they knew them less because, well, they were in Latin, and they, they didn't know Latin uh, that much. Yes, so, so it was very important for them, very important. So, let me ask this, how was St. Mark of Ephesus identified during the council? I've read in scholarship that he was the legate of Alexandria, is that true? Uh, well, um, the, um, well, he was first appointed as uh, the legate of Alexandria, but later, later the situation changed and he was reappointed as legate of Antioch, uh, and it even caused a, a dissension between him and the final representative of Alexandria uh, with Gregory Mamas, uh, the confessor of the emperor.
they had a who, who, who makes a decision that he's the legate of one than the other the emperor uh well uh mm, it was in this way first before the council uh there was a list of uh bishops of the uh, well constantinopolitan bishops that were uh, educated enough uh, which were uh, uh theologically good enough and it was presented to the eastern patriarchs uh for them to choose uh, their representatives they of course had no uh, well they never met their representatives they didn't even know who exactly was for example mark of ephesus uh, or Bessarion of nicaea of well or isidore of kiev or dorotheos of mytilini they never met them they just had a list and an imperial ambassador who presented uh, those people to the patriarchs. Well, and uh, the patriarchs just chose uh, names from this list, uh, like, well, I choose Mark of Ephesus, or, or when the other patriarch says, well, then I'll choose uh, Bessarion of Nicaea. It may, uh, well, it may seem a, a bit strange, and it was a bit strange, but it was the case. It was the case. But later, later, uh, the place, uh, well, they were, later the um, representatives were changed during the uh, letters exchange, uh, exchanged with, oh, sorry, well, forget it. I, I, just uh, I just confused everything. Well, no, it's pretty much, Bessarion, um, St. Mark Ephesus, to lesser degree, though he wasn't a main player, uh, the Scolarios, these guys were pretty much professional arguers. And before the council, they made them bishops just so that they had the right to actually represent to represent them. They weren't bishops before this council. Yes. And so pretty much they were just, it's almost like when, you, this is an American reference, no offense, but like when O.J. Simpson had this, team of lawyers and they called it the dream team they, they picked the lawyer who is best for arguing each part of the case it's a big famous american court case so in uh -huh. the same way in in ferrara and florence they'd pick oh we're gonna want uh we're gonna want uh saint mark to represent us right now and so like they'd pick saint mark and then he would represent them so yes yes it's not typical of earlier councils but like the example i said it's not unknown at least in in legal proceedings um so that aside anyway how did saint mark conduct himself because there are orthodox who make him out that he's a firebrand and he wouldn't compromise in the faith and he spoke in every very uncompromising unyielding manner we have other uh scholars like father christian cops who's a unit um who said well no actually saint mark was very deferential and would have wanted a union on appropriate terms if they didn't compromise in the philly quay in your opinion having read his stuff how did saint mark conduct himself during this council was he as polemical and anti-roman as is popularly imagined saint mark was a very educated man as a young man he was uh, teaching rhetoric in constantinople and after a period of uh, hesychastic solitude when he returned to the city he was a member of Currently, theological circle presided by the emperor himself. Uh, the other members were Bessarion, Isidor, uh, Scalarius, and others. So, uh, well, he even had a friendly relationship with Nicholas of Cusa when Cusanus came to Constantinople. Well, this uh, famous Renaissance man and later a cardinal of the Roman Church. So he was never. Well, an aggressive, uh, fanatical zealot, uh, while hating everything Western. It is not the case, of course. His early conciliar speeches uh, show that he sincerely believed that reunion was possible and that Latins just need to hear proper explanation of the Orthodox position to correct their mistakes. His speech on the first session I mentioned was, well, very beautiful. It was a hymn of charity. Well, um, just imagine he even calls Roman Church a sister church. This famous ecumenical catchphrase, uh, sister churches, was used by St. Mark of Ephesus, actually. Uh, but also, at the same time, St. Mark was a person with a certain temperament, so to say. 
It is obvious from the minutes that he was annoyed by Leighton's playing for time, talking nonsense, going off topic, well, playing dirty, uh, playing dirty game, so to say. And while he initially was very open-minded and ready for the dialogue, he gradually became more and more harsh, more and more, well, anti Leighton over the course of the sessions. And it is, well, completely understandable. Like uh, during the 11th session in Ferrara, Gnau Cesarini constantly interrupted him and didn't let him to say a word for the whole session, really. He ne didn't manage to finish um, most of his phrases. And um, during the early sessions, Leighton tried to forbid him to read the definitions of the ecumenical councils. So he just saw that they are not arguing in good faith. And when, when, uh, when he understood it, uh, then he became anti Leighton, he became uh, uncompromising, he became harsh. Yes, maybe. But he started as a very openly disposed. So St. Mark was willing to discuss matters and forge a consensus while the Latin side wanted to the Greeks to simply submit. And when yes. St. Mark realized we're not here to forge a consensus, we're here to unconditionally submit to what the Latins dictate, that's when he became very terse. Is that a short way of saying it? Yes, 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 uh, exactly in this way. All right, so how about Pope Eugene IV? How was he identified during his council and how did he conduct himself? Uh, well, Pope Eugene, uh, yes, he was, uh, Pope mostly kept silence during consular sessions. Uh, he never participated in public discussions uh, himself only once during the discussion in Ferrara about uh, after this uh, speech of the Syrian, he summoned cardinals to him to secretly discuss the tactics. But outside the sessions, before and after them, he played an important role. For example, he insisted that Greek and Latin delegates should take seats to the left and right from him while he would sit in the middle as a common judge of both sides. And uh, his demand to do this, well, uh, it nearly ruined the council from the beginning because Greeks didn't want to submit to it, yes? Serapolos even mentioned that Eugene wanted Petrarch and all Greek bishops uh, to kiss his foot and uh, that this insistence alone almost destroyed Petrarch's readiness to participate in the council. Well, Petrarch just said that if he wants me to kiss his foot, I'll just go home and uh, everything will end without beginning. So, so again, this, so this ties into what I said before. The way he conducted himself was that there he's there to dictate terms and he he's the final arbiter in these matters. Would that be yes, roughly accurate? Yes. yes, but then Greeks managed to, well, to convince him to, uh, well, to calls himself not as the leader of the whole council, but as the leader of the latent side of the council. But it didn't help much because, well, even if he sat with the latents, not in the middle as a common judge of everyone, he still thought himself uh, the judge, the leader, the chief, the head of everything happening. Well, and after public sessions, he quite harshly insisted that Greek accepted all demands of the Ro Roman church. Uh, for example, Bessarion and Isida tried to secure rights of Petrarch of the Pentarchy, but Eugene was adamant in affirming absolute papal power, absolute papal power as uh, a universal pastor and leader of the whole Christian Church. And I need to say, he really hated Saint Mark. I mean, really hated. Uh, there is a letter to his uh, to his legate, Bis uh, Bishop. Christopher Gratoni, he calls in this letter, he calls St. Mark this full Ephesine who spew his poison everywhere, and also says that he asked the emperor to punish St. Mark as St. Constantine punished Arius, but the emperor refused. So he really, really hated St. Mark. And so, interestingly enough, uh, Pope Eugene was asserting universal jurisdiction and the Greek side was at least initially rejecting this. And, and that was the friction between the two. They were willing to accept him as patriarch of the West and of uh, the elder patriarch of the rest of the patriarchs, but not as the supreme universal uh, pastor of the whole church. Yes, um, even, even after Greeks agreed to Philiope, it's important. 
even after they agreed to the Leighton Dogma, they didn't agree to these jurisdictional questions. Uh, well, and agreed only after considerable pressure. And so that was because that anticipates my next question about whether jurisdictional issues came up during the council. Did the council ever resolve that the Pope had universal jurisdiction or did the Greek side never assent to this? Well, uh, jurisdictional questions were discussed only in the end, uh, during the la after after the last sessions in Florence. Uh, the Greeks tried to turn to the uh, papal question, uh, so to say, to the papacy as the subject of discussion uh, already in Ferrara, but they didn't manage to convince Leighton to discuss this question. And when Bessarion and Isidor uh, discussed uh, papal jurisdiction with the, po with the Pope Eugene in the end of the council, well, of course, it was not the presentation of the Orthodox position uh, in its wholeness. You know, they were unites after all. Um, but still, uh, still, they tried to secure some kind of independence for the Greek church. And uh, the conciliar decree, it speaks about uh, Pope being supreme pastor, about uh, him about him hold uh, about him being true vicar of Christ, uh, success of blessed Pe uh, Peter, the head of the whole church, and father and teacher uh, of the all Christians, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, it uh, speaks about plenitude of potestatis of the Pope, but still in the Greek version of the conciliar decree, uh, it is formulated like well, as much as uh, ecumenical councils and canons permit him. In the Latin version, it is not in this way. From, uh, but in the Greek version, it is formulated in a somewhat restrictive way, so to say. They try now, to in, the in the conciliar decree, does the Latin and Greek uh, um, differ on any other important issue? And what other important issues does that decree cover? No, only uh, the difference, uh, the only, well, Important, uh, obvious difference is uh, this last question about pa papal jurisdiction. Only this question is uh, treated differently in Greek and Latin uh, versions of the decree. And, well, the difference is very slight. It is very uh, nuanced, but it still exists. Now, in your opinion, is the Latin more reliable in the decree or the Greek more reliable in the decree? Well, uh, you know, it was not meant uh, to be, well, uh, one way or another. Uh, the Greek version of the decree was made to be presented to the Greek patriarchs. The Latin version was uh, made to be used by the Pope. So, so you're saying it was purposely different and it was made so that both sides could sell it to their constituencies. Yes, I think I think it is so. Uh, well, we can't. Uh, we have no well strict mathematical proofs about it, but I think it is so. Okay. Well, and I think that's so in earlier ecumenical councils as well. Some matters, and that's an ongoing debate. But that aside, did the decree cover any other doctrines like purgatory, the filioque? Obviously, um, are there any other issues that decree covered? Uh, well, the decree covered all the questions uh, which were discussed. The creed, the creed, uh, the filioque, uh, well, uh, the purgatory, uh, papacy, and, well, and the living and unleavened bread. Uh, yes, yes, that, yes. Okay. And uh, so, so all the questions uh, which were divisive for Greek and Latins, they were all covered in the decree, and well, they were all solved in favor of the Latin position. Well, it was just a capitulation of the Greeks, except for the jurisdictional uh, jurisdictional thing. Well, and we'll get into the capitulation, and I don't think it's coincidental that the jurisdictional issue wasn't capitulated to, because the whole the whole reason the Greeks capitulated was for political. Uh, reasons and so why would they capitulate yeah. politically <laughs> it doesn't make any yes. sense but but back into the nitty-gritty saint maximus the confessor's letter to marinus was according to Sylvester Seropolis, offered as a reunion formula three times by the greek delegation do the minutes of the council bear this out 
Well, uh, yes, the letter, uh, uh, the letter of Saint Maximus was uh, really the most important text for the Council. Well, uh, it is no exaggeration, it is really the most important text. Uh, the first time it was read uh, in the Council, it was read by Andrew of Rhodes, uh, the Unaid, yes. Uh, he read this text, uh, this text by, but he distorted it in his reading. He read in, in Greek and translated it into Latin himself. And in the Latin translation, he distorted the text. The text oh, uh, he, so he distorted it to make it more of a profiliquist text. Yes, yes, and, uh, yes. Okay. It was very, very, very interesting. Uh, you, uh, if you remember the text, yes, uh, it says that Saint Maximus says that uh, son is not the cause idea of the Holy Spirit, yep. and uh, that even Romans of his time accepted that Father is the only cause, the only idea of both Son and Holy Spirit. And uh, in the latent translation made by Andrew of Rhodes, it was not said that Father is the only cause of the uh, Son and Spirit. It was in this latent translation, uh, it was said that Romans know that Son and Father is one cause of the Holy Spirit. Imagine it. And uh, and uh, so, and he was, this this is a bombshell because I've read several articles from scholars on this, and no one has mentioned that Andrew Rhodes was different on this all important point. Everything hinges on this point. So let me clear. We're gonna we're gonna focus on this a little bit, Peter. And I appreciate your patience. And so. He's caught, Andrew says these two different translations. Is he the American expression is caught with his pants down? Like, do people say that's not what it really says in the Greek? Like, what what happened next? Yes, 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 yes. He was uh, caught, uh, as you said, with his pants down, uh, really, because uh, well, uh, the translator, uh, his name was Nicholas Secundinus. Uh, he just said, "Well, stop." Uh, it is not what uh, you just read in Greek. Uh, you just uh, you just lied. And Andrew Frodo said, "I'll prove that uh, the Saint uh, that Saint Maximus wanted to say what uh, exactly what I just uh, translated. It was not a, a lie. It was just an interpretation." And uh, and, and yeah. so he's saying what Saint Maximus said in Greek is not really what he wanted to mean. What he wanted to yeah, mean is how I exactly. want. The Greek to be rendered in Latin. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And oh, was, unbelievable. Was, unbelievable. And, and, and so was this embarrassing? Was this explanation embarrassing? How did the council both sides respond to this? It was it was really embarrassing. And I honestly think that it was after this, uh, after this, uh, Andrew of Rhodes was, well, put aside. Uh, they let uh, him to Oh, so that's there. why he was no longer allowed to talk, because this debacle. Yes. Yes, yes, yes because, <laughs> because it was unbelievable. Uh, as we say in Russian, "Pozdravlyem, господин Savramsh." I'm sure in Russia, Russian, that's very clever. But we Americans are idiots when we speak English. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> so anyway, that, so that aside, he's called his pants down, and do the Latin. So how do the Latins respond? To the well, Greek saying, yes, we, we agree with what the Greek says. What's the Latin side respond to that? Uh, in the session, nothing. In the session, nothing. But after the session, and it was uh, described by Seropoulos, it, it is not directed in the minutes because it was after the session. Uh, Seropoulos says uh, that the Greeks came to Latins and said, well, he presented this text. Uh, we completely agree with what was said. Let us just unite on the basis of this text. Let us make this text, uh, well, the decree of the council. And Latins uh, answered that uh, they do not accept uh, the text at all. They do not accept it as authentic, like Andrew of Rhodes just used it uh, out of his own will, and Pope and Cardinals uh, do not agree with its authenticity. Now, so because people are going to critique this, the 
Andrew of Rhodes posing the text in both Greek and Latin, is that in the minutes or is that just recounted in Seropolis's yes, memoirs? Yes, yes, no. Andrew of Rhodes presenting the text in Greek and Latin is uh, in minute, in the minutes. In do the Athena. Latins do the Latins in the minutes ever disown the text for Maximus? Uh, and uh, well, can you repeat it, please? Do do did the Latin side ever disown, meaning reject uh, what yes. Maximus text in the minutes of the council? No, in the minutes uh, they did not do it. They did not do it, but from the writings of uh, Becerion, uh, from his later texts uh, written after the council, we know that they really rejected the authenticity of the text. Becerion uh, writes. So, so Becerion says the Latins wouldn't ascribe to the text because they uh, they rejected its authenticity. Yes. Yes. Now, did Bessarion ever comment on whether what he or what the Latin side viewed as the theology of the text, or are they or they only focused in on its alleged authenticity? Bessarion said that uh, it is just not authentic, but if it was authentic, we may say that St. Maximus uh, meant not uh, that Son is not uh, the cause of the Holy Spirit. He just meant that Son is not the primary cause of the Holy Spirit. And so, so then, so Bessarion essentially gave the same interpretation that Andrew Rhodes gave in the actual minutes. Yes, yes, of course. And okay. he, yes. And so Andrew Rhodes presents this in the minutes. Um, it gets disputed. And then after that, is it now a non-issue in the minutes? Is it never mentioned ever again? Uh, St. Mark of Ephesus uh, tries to introduce the text uh, as uh, the ground for the Union several times. During uh, the Council? Well, uh, in the minutes. As far as, far as I remember, once in, Flor once in Florence during the, during the sessions. But uh, I'm not sure. I need to, to, to look for it. Okay. Uh, well, and, and, the... and in your recollection, because you didn't translate this yet, so, yet, yes, so you're going yes, by recollection. Yes, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not clear, and I have the text on my computer. And, but, and so uh, how, what do you remember their response being to St. Mark floating uh, St. Maximus again? But uh, we just know that uh, Latins rejected uh, this proposal uh, because, well, may I introduce the other uh, critical text, uh, St. Basil uh, addresses Hymnomium. Yes, uh, these were two complementary texts because St. Maximus, in his letter, says that uh, Son is not the cause, idea of the Holy Spirit, while in the uh, late inversion, so so-called late inversion of uh, the text of Saint Basil, it is said that Son is the cause, idea of the Holy Spirit. So, well, uh, they could only accept as uh, only one text as authentic. And from the conciliar decree, we know that they accepted uh, the late inversion of Saint Basil, not 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 uh, Saint Maximus. Now, so long story short, because they went and explained which text, which we're about to get into, St. Basil's uh, against Eunomius, um, which text, which variant they agreed with uh, over the same issue, they in passing rejected Maximus because the rendering that Maximus had would have agreed with the text of, uh, of St. Basil that they didn't want to accept. Is that a good yes. synopsis? Okay. Uh, yes, yes. So All it right. was was the only option for them. And so I'm going to ask you to put your theologian's hat on for a moment, um, which would be, how did the decree of Florence disagree with St. Maximus? In other words, why was the decree made as stated and not quoting Maximus as what the Greek delegation originally wanted in the decree? Well, um, you see, uh, well, the conciliar decree, the conciliar decree, uh, mm, well. Because the, I'm going to go by memory, maybe this will jog yours, that the conciliar decree states that the mm, spirit okay. proceeds from the father and the son as a single principle. Yes. And, and, that, uh, and then it says, and in principle to the Greeks is cause. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I understood what, you, what, what do you mean, yes. So, well, 
Mm, sorry, my English may be a bit clumsy and I'm a bit slow. So, yes. Uh, Saint Maximus uh, basically says that sun is not the cause, idea of the, of the Holy Spirit. And the decree really says that uh, sun is uh, what Greek call, uh, what the Greeks call cause, secundum graecum causam idea, uh, and uh, what Latins call principle, yes, principium, principle. And well, so uh, the conciliar decree was was um, was written, was composed to contradict uh, Saint Maximus' letter to Marinus, because it was proposed by Saint Mark of Ephesus as uh, the ground for the union. So, well, uh, so so just to clarify, the the decree on the Philoque with that specific wording about uh, that the Spirit proceeds from the Father, Son as a single principle and cause was deliberately worded to explicitly contradict Maximus. Is that true? Yes, it was exactly, exactly worded to contradict Maximus. Oh, 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 exactly, and it was the case because it was the main proof text for St. Mark of Ephesus. It was his main weapon, so to say. And, uh, well, they just needed, uh, they just needed to exclude this text, to contradict it, because they were condemning St. Mark of Ephesus with rejecting his his favorite proof text. Uh, well, that, absolute, know, absolute bombshell. Absolute yes. bombshell. Um, being that we're going to have to wait until you publish on this, what are your reasonings for this interpretation? Or is this just so explicit? Well, it, well, first of all, it's explicit. It's, of course, explicit. And, well, we have two, uh, as we'll, uh, we have already said, we have two critical, most important texts. Yes, uh, Saint uh, Maximus and Saint Basil. And uh, well, we'll mention, and uh, of course, uh, the text of Saint Basil uh, uh, discussed in Florence uh, had two versions. One uh, original version, uh, which uh, just described the relationship between the Son and Holy Spirit. And uh, they interpolated uh, the later uh, version, uh, which contained uh, the affirmation that the Son is the cause of the Holy Spirit. Now uh, it is proved by um, Michel Van Paris and uh, by Alexios Alexakis, uh, two scholars uh, who researched yep. this text, uh, that uh, this interpolated later version of the text was eunomion in its sense and probably it was a fragment of, of eunomios that was in a uh, which was by chance uh included into contra eunomium well just just like a mistake well and uh, latens accepted this version of the text and uh disagreed with saint maximus because saint maximus text was used by Greek apologists, not only by Saint Mark. Before him, it was used by Nilus Cabeselas mm. and other Greek uh, Greek apologists. So, well, uh, it is obvious from everything which was uh, what was said uh, in Florence about it, because well, just just it was all about these texts, these two texts uh, contradicting contradicting each other and choosing one of them. They chose right, so so I'm going to interrupt for a second for the audience, which is we're talking about Saint Basil's Caesarea's Against Eunomius Book Three. There were two variants, both in the Greek. So scholarship will call one the Latin text, one the Greek text. But the Latin it's really the Latin sides text in Greek and the Greek sides text in Greek. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Greek text from the Greek side, now modern scholarship affirms, is the correct, accurate text. And yes. the Greek text from the Latin side, which we're going to get into some of its textual history, is now acknowledged by scholarship to be falsified. And yeah. what Peter here is emphasizing is that this whole council was decided when they came to the wrong textual decision on St. Basil Caesarea's Against Eunomius Book 3, and that the whole decree of the council is based upon the wrong spurious text of St. Basil Caesarea's um, Against Eunomius Book 3. And so literally we have a decree of this council based upon a heretical rendering, spurious rendering, of St. Basil's text. And yeah. so... I mean that that's that's mind blowing today. 
Uh, you know, but the question would be is, were they acting in good faith at the time? What reasons did they have at the time to accept the spurious text? Well, uh, I need to add that uh, it was not the only spurious text that uh, decided the fate of the council. Because on the creed, uh, the discussion of the creed was uh, decided by spurious text too. Uh, by, uh, well, um, pseudo Isidorian decretals. Is it how it is called? Yes, yep. Pseudo Isidorian decretals, yep. Yes, yes. Um, well, it was a spurious letter from Pope Liberius to St. Athanasius, which affirmed that the prohibition to change the creed uh, was already included in the canons of the Council of Nicaea, and that uh, accordingly it did not mean that the creed cannot be changed uh, according to the letter, according to the wording, only according to the sense. So, well, the first part of the council about the creed was also decided by this spurious text, uh, which St. Mark uh, said it was spurious, but Latins used it as the main proof text. Uh, so it is very, very funny. But yes, uh, the whole council, uh, it was based on the spurious uh, false reading, uh, well, Eunomian reading of St. Basil and on rejection of true and orthodox letter of uh, St. Maximus. It is the whole story about it. Now, but were they acting in good faith? Did they, like, yeah. they weren't knowingly putting forward spurious texts, and I've read in um, uh, Bessarian's comments that they would actually looked into the age of some of these texts, and they appeared more ancient, allegedly, than the Greek side's text. Um, St. Mark of Ephesus had a recollection that his text was actually much older. So do you think both sides had very old text? Or what do, what do you think of the... Do you think they're operating in good faith? Well, uh, Latins were acting in good faith, in my opinion. I think that they were uh, sincere in uh, their, uh, their reading. But on the other side, you see, when Andrew of Rhodes just blatantly lied during the consider session and was caught blatantly lying, well, uh, uh, after that, we can, uh, we can just suppose that, well, they could be sincere, but they desperately to wanted limit. the Maximus text to be false. They desperately wanted it to be false. and. Because of are there are there so are there any other indications that the Latin side did things that were insincere, which then call into their integrity, their uh, assessment of this text? Well, um, other than I'm, because, like you said, they use other spurious text, but the question is, were they purposely choosing they interplay the text where they knew better? Like Tom Aquinas in Against the Greek said. I suspect a lot of these texts are spurious, but he used them anyway. So the question is, did they use texts that they suspected to be spurious, or did they really, using the best scholarship of their time, think these texts were accurate? Uh, well, it is two different questions. Were they sincere, and did they use the best scholarship? It is different questions. I think that the best patristic scholar uh, in uh, the council was definitely St. Mark of Ephesus because he had just a great patristic, patrological, so to say, intuition. He just could somehow discern false text from true text, and he almost never was mistaken in this respect. And, well, Latins could have known that text they were using were spurious. For example, Lorenz Zavala wrote his uh, treatise about uh, the donation of Constantine, it was used too, of course, uh, being spurious, being false text, like 20 years after the council or something of that kind. So they could have known that decretals were false. They could have known that the letter to, Maximo, uh, to Marinus was true. They could have known it. But uh, they did not, uh, well, explore the question much. They did not investigate much. I think. So they, so you, your expert opinion. They preferred not to touch it. It is good. Yeah. Well, let us not, uh, let, let us not dig to, to, to. So your expert opinion was they use something that could have plausibly been true, but 
they perp it was too convenient to question whether it was spurious because it was too convenient for their side. Yes, it was too convenient, and they just tried not to think about it too much. All righty. So let me. Um, how did St. Mark of Ephesus then respond? You made the brief mention that he's been proved to be correct, meaning modern scholarship now has found that the arguments that St. Mark brought up about the text he's hearing being spurious are the same exact arguments that scholars have found. Yes, these are good reasons to reject their, excuse me, authenticity. Um, could you could you at least explain for the audience how St. Mark, Mark of Ephesus responded to these spurious texts? Well, uh, when he was speaking about uh, the first curious text, about Decretals, about uh, the letter of uh, Pseudo Liberius, uh, it was, well, easy. He just said that what it is said there in this uh, letter, it just contradicts what we know about the decrees of Nicaea. It just contradicts, and so it must be spurious. Uh, when uh, it uh, when the question was about uh, the text of Saint Basil, he pointed that uh, the whole logic of this uh, uh, this fragment uh, in Latin version, in so-called Latin version, contradicts what Saint Basil could have said. For example, this Latin version said that uh, the Holy Spirit is third. After the uh, well, that son is second, and the Holy Spirit is third uh, in respect of honor in Trinity. So basically, the Latin version of this fragment affirmed that three persons of the Most Holy Trinity don't have equal honor; they have so a subordinationist. Sub yes, it was subordinationist. So and Florence dogmatized subordinationism. <laughs> well, I don't think they, uh, they uh, in the decree there is uh, no mention about the difference in honor, but still, still the Latin theologians in, Ferrar, uh, in Florence used their, well, their subordinationist text. And St. Mark pointed at it. He said, St. Basil uh, will never, uh, will never from something uh, so clearly subordinationist. And well, it is uh, well a very sound, a very good reasoning. Uh, it was especially first. considering everything Saint Basil has written elsewhere disagreeing with that. Yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, well, I think that uh, that it was his main point. Oh, he also used uh, uh, well text, textile criticism. He used ancient manuscripts. Uh, he pointed at. Uh, well, that no church historian and no other uh, theologian and writer quotes uh, the text in its uh, latent version. Well, no one quotes Saint Basil saying that a Holy Spirit is caused by Son, or that it is third in respect of honor after the Son, and so on. And uh, well, it is too well a very modern. Uh, way of proving some text is spurious or false. So St. Um, Mark could be treating, could be teaching at your university textual criticism. Well, uh, if he had enough time to prepare for it, I think he could. He could, well, different, definitely he could. So that being said, how did the council treat Book 1, Chapter 8 of Damascene's Exposition of the Orthodox Faith and its very clear and unequivocal assertion that the Father alone is the eternal cause of the Holy Spirit? So, like, yes. did they just ignore it and say John of Damascus was wrong? Uh, did they have a forged text? How do they treat this issue? Well, uh, you know, there were three theologians in the East who affirmed that Father is the only cause in the Trinity and Son is not the cause. Uh, there were three of them. It was Saint Gregory the theologian, it was Saint Maximus the confessor, and it was Saint John Damascene. Yes, uh, well, Damascene just took it from Gregory the theologian as he usually does. But uh, in the West, uh, Damascene was known as an anti philacrist They knew that he is well pro Greek father, so to say. And uh, if you so, he was a second tier father to the to the west side. Well, they 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 honored him. They thought that he was the last of great great Eastern Church fathers. But still, uh, Th Thomas Thomas Aquinas Aquinas I don't know Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas yeah, 
Aquinas. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, well, uh, if you remember in his uh, Summa Theolog uh, Theologica, uh, he says that Damascene was wrong on this subject, or he must be understood as not uh, saying that Father is the only cause. Like, well, like... Andrew like what they did with Maximus. So meaning we'll have to reinterpret him to be other than his words clearly state, or well, he's just wrong. On the one hand, yes, and on the other hand, they just... Uh, it was a common assertion in the West that uh, Damascene was either wrong or need to be completely reinterpreted. So, uh, well, just using Damascene as a proof text for the Greek was use, uh, useless because the Westerns will just not accept it. And they did not accept it. And so was it brought up at all? Because it was brought up during the Council of Lyon in 1274. So did the text, what, did it have any mention at all during the Council of Florence? Uh, if I remember correctly, St. Mark of Ephesus used him uh, as a part of his huge fl florilegium of church fathers and uh, historians and passages from the Holy Scripture, proving that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. But uh, it was not discussed much. Saint Saint Mark just quoted him, and Leighton's just said, "Well, okay." Yeah, so they did. They just didn't address it. Let me ask this question: Did Anthony of Heraclea attempt to present Gregory the Second of Cyprus's definition to the Council of Constantinople 1285? So that people are aware, the Council of Constantinople in 1285, um, it's sometimes called um, the. Oh, I'm having a brain fart. The uh, what's the name of that? Whatever. Well, anyway, in 1285, they have this council, and it's in response to the Council of Lyon. So I've read that Anthony Heraclea tried to present this definition because this definition was the Orthodox's, Orthodoxy's conciliar response to the Filioque issue. Um, is that correct? Is scholarship correct in presenting that this is what Anthony Heraclea did? Do you not remember? Could he give us any details? Yes. Yes, Anthony of... Oh, uh, and by the way, Council, Council of Blatrine is what I was thinking of. All right, continue. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, this council, uh, well, Anthony of uh, Heraclea tried to present this text, but it was not during public conciliar sessions. Okay. It was during private meeting of the Greek delegation uh, in the end after the public sessions. Well, he tried to do it, but uh, Basil Bessarion and Emperor John just uh, forbade him to do it. They laughed at him, they, uh, oh, or it was Gregory Mamas, I don't remember, someone from uh, of the units and the emperor just did not let him to read uh, the definition of this council. Yes, just didn't let him to do it. Okay, so, so pretty much he was forbidden from accepting the, uh, from putting forward the orthodox conciliar definition. Yes. How were how were other doctrines treated during this council? Like, how about indulgences? Well, and the indulgences were not discussed at length. Uh, they only discussed uh, purgatory as as such. Yes, with no respect to uh, indulgences. Uh, well, um, so uh, so yes. Well, and so uh, then, how they discuss purgatory? Yes, they discussed it before the official uh, sessions began. It was uh, somewhat of preparatory stage of the council, uh, the most, well, the least dangerous topic to discuss, I think. Mm, St. Mark of Ephesus uh, was the main speaker uh, during the discussions. And well, it was a very constructive discussion because, uh, well, in modern scholarship, in modern scholarship, it is often said that the discussion uh, uh, of purgatory uh, missed the point because it just failed to recognize the latent juris, uh, well, uh, the latent legalism, the latent juridism, and so on. But I don't think uh, it is so. Well, Saint Mark of Ephesus uh, just didn't think that legalism is that bad. Well. It, it is bad if it is uh, too much legalism, but uh, a little legalism is not that bad. So they uh, just discussed it in a very constructive way, and St. Mark of Ephesus even proposed well, some, kind of, uh, some kind of consensual, some kind of... Uh, compromise. So what was, what compromise. was uh, 
What was St. Mark's compromise in purgatory? He, uh, he proposed that, uh, well, he said that uh, the Orthodox can accept that there are three kinds of uh, dead people. The saints, well, or just, just people, yes, who go to the heaven. There are uh, irredeemable sinners uh, who died in mortal sins who just go to hell to await their punishment. And there are so-called middle people, yes? Uh, and they, they go to hell too. Well, St. Mark refused to accept uh, purgatory as... The as a separate place. Faith, yes. But he said that those middle people uh, may, be, uh, may be rescued, may be saved from the hell by the prayers of the church. Uh, he even said that those middle people are those who committed non-mortal sins or those who committed sins uh, and died without uh, having enough fruit of repentance, without having fruitful... So, so pretty much St. Mark Ephesus gave the teaching of the Council of Jerusalem 1672 with one of its decrees. And, well, yeah. and he okay. recognized that the Roman doctrine of purgatory the wrong in aspects was analogous at least to the correct orthodox doctrine yes it was analogous but uh he refused to accept the cleansing punishment uh well the what punishment uh, i'm sorry uh, well the punishment that purifies uh those punished okay you know. Uh, he refused to accept this and he refused to accept uh purgatory as uh, the separate third place uh, so, well, these were the main points of difference for him, but uh, the Latins did not agree even to this conciliatory c c c compromise. So, so they wanted to assert that the punishment in purgatory was atoning, and they, yeah. wanted, to, and they wanted to assert that purgatory was actually a separate place and wasn't simply well, Hades. About, about purgatory being a place, it is not included in the in the decree of Florence. Uh, it is not included in the decree of Florence. But about uh, the punishment in purgatory uh, being uh, uh, being purifying, yes, it is included, and it was important for Latins. All right. So let me ask this question: How did the emperor silence Mark of Ephesus? You know, I presume he couldn't put duct tape over his mouth. So, um, how did he do it, and why did he have to silence um, St. Mark Ephesus? Why did Mark just speak up and ignore well, the emperor? Well, uh, it was uh, first during the early conciliar sessions in Ferrara, for example, uh, the emperor supported St. Mark. He even protected him from the Latins. It was very interesting to see the emperor protect St. Mark from Latins. But later, when uh, the emperor understood that theological discussions are useless and they can't convince Latins and he needed this union uh, for political reasons uh, well he was ready to do anything uh, to uh, achieve this union he was ready to do anything and uh, he silenced St. Mark to stop uh, him from discussing discussing anything with Latins because discussions were harmful for his political goals and so, yes, he, forbid, uh, he forbade him to speak in the uh, internal discussions of the Greek delegation uh, and made him, made him keep silence. And why Mark didn't just speak up? Because, well, because it was useless. Because uh, the, bishops, the bishops were, well, they lacked will, they lacked uh, they lacked uh, bravery, they lacked, uh, well, some kind of conscience to oppose the emperor. They were just too weak weak uh, to oppose him, and St. Mark just uh, thought that it will be pointless to, to protest. So essentially, it was understood what the emperor says goes during this council. And, if, and the only way to resist him was just to be silent. Uh, well, well, sorry, uh, can you repeat it, please? So, would you say it's accurate to say it was understood that whatever the emperor says goes for the Greek delegation, and so if you oppose the emperor, the only response was to be silent? Yes, yes, it was the case. Now, uh, let me ask this. Did St. Augustine ever come up during the council, and how were his writings treated? Uh, well, uh, well... 
Uh, St. Augustine was used both by Greeks and Latins. Uh, St. Mark of Ephesus referred to St. Augustine's writings several times himself uh, to, well, first to refute uh, purgatory. It is, well, it is interesting that uh, St. Augustine was used to refute purgatory and not to prove it. Well, on the other hand, uh, St. Mark of Ephesus used uh, St. Augustine to uh, to prove that church fathers are not infallible, that uh, individual fathers have to be, well, uh, have to be treated in accordance with consensus patrum and uh, the conciliar decisions. Well, uh, Wait, you just... Now we have the toddler teaching us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God bless oh, yes, uh, and, and uh, Saint Augustine was uh, was yes used by both Greeks and Latins, and he was well like a common father, like Saint Basil, like any other. And so was was Saint Augustine used at all in the Philoque issue by the Greek side or no? Uh, well, he was mostly used by Latin side, uh, and later after the council. Later, after the council, the Greek uh, theologian Gen uh, Gennadius Hilarius, yes, um, yes. Uh, the disciple of Saint Mark of Ephesus, he um, he proposed an orthodox interpretation of Saint Augustine on, uh, and, and and was this based upon the psychological trinities and on the Trinity? Uh, he used it, but uh, it was uh, not his main point. He uh, just used the difference between. Latin procedere and Greek ek porevin. Okay, yes, so he, he did, he parsed the languages then. Um, all right, and so in what regard was Constantinople, Const, the Council of Constantinople for 879-880 held during this council? It is interesting. It is interesting uh, because, well, uh, St. Mark of Ephesus uh, referred to it as the eighth uh, uh, ecumenical council during the third or fourth session in Ferrara. And uh, Cardinal Giuliano Cesarini did not disagree, did not disagree. But later, uh, Andrew of Rhodes uh, tried to disagree, tried to argue, and uh, well, as usual, it was not very successful. It was, well, uh, sh uh, shameful, because he said that uh, such council never took place. <laughs> he just said that there was no such council. Yes, yes, a Andrew was a great person, well, uh, like he pr proves all kinds of amusement for the Orthodox reader, I think. Well, yes, so um, the Greeks proposed it as an ecumenical council and as one of the grounds for the union because uh, it prohibited all changes to the creed. Uh, and Latins either ignored it or, uh, like Andrew of Rhodes, uh, tried to prove that no such council ever took place. And so. Uh, did sorry, did they speak of this council? Sorry, uh, did, uh, Craig, I wanted to say that we have like twenty minutes uh, because well it is a bit late here and I'll have to uh, shut down after twenty. All right, so we're gonna have to do rapid fire questions, guys, and because Peter is very important. Um, who is Isaiah of Stavropolis, and was his failure to sign to Florence a sort of opposition to the council? Yes, Isaiah of uh, Stavropolis is one of, uh, well, like three bishops who did not sign uh, the uh, Union Decree. Uh, the first was St. Mark of Ephesus, of course, everyone knows him. The second one was the Georgian uh, Iverian bishop from Georgia, uh, who ran away uh, from uh, from Florence to uh, not to sign the the decree, and the last one was Isaiah of Staropolis. He was a very simple man. He was not even literate, uh, I think, and he just ran away during the night before uh, the day of signing the decree. Uh, well, like uh, nearly barefooted, uh, he just climbed the wall and ran away because Greek bishops were not allowed to leave the city. And he just ran away and uh, on his foot, he ran uh, to the Constantinople from Ferrara, yes, uh, like for months. Uh, he uh, went on his foot, not known Latin, uh, being a Greek uh, through all these countries. He was a great and very brave man, even a bit simple. So yes, it was a sign of opposition. Of the, the and so it's greatly exaggerated that 
everyone actually signed on to this thing because we know three people that didn't and that were bishops. So let me ask this. Was the Greek delegation actually starved into submission or is this exaggerated? It is a bit exaggerated uh, because, well, the only one who was starved propositely, it was St. Mark of Ephesus. Pope stopped giving him money uh, to buy food uh, from some stage of the council, from uh, after translating the council to, Ferra, uh, to Florence. And how did he eat? Yes, he, he, was, he was left without money, but, uh, well, it seems that uh, his ascetic uh, character, well, he, uh, he survived it well. Well, um, so, no, I don't think they were staffed propositely. But, uh, as I already said, they were weak. They were submissive. They were ready to accept everything the emperor says because they just were, were like opportunists. They were too weak to, to, to resist. Not everyone, of course, but uh, most of Greek bishops said. What, what, what was St. Nicholas Cabasillus' role during the council? Oh, I think it is a mistake. You say St. Nicholas, but it was not St. Nicholas. It was his uncle. It was Nihilus Cabasillus, Archbishop. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes. Um, well, they were, they are often mistake. Uh, they are often confused. It is okay because uh, Uncle Nihilus was called Nicholas before his uh, monasticism, so he was basically Nicholas. Well, um, he was the main Greek uh, apologist uh, in the 14th century, and his writings were held in a very high regard by everyone. Uh, St. Mark of Ephesus uh, studied his works and basically used his reasoning and his arguments <coughs> nearly all the time. Uh, well, for example, there is an unedited text by St. Mark. It is called uh, The Greek Answers to the Latent Questions, as far as I remember. Uh, to the yes to, to, to the latent questions and uh, it is basically a short conspect of uh, things he would say in the council and uh, the uh, question of papacy is treated exactly on, uh, like in uh, the writings of Neil Nihilus Cabasilus like word to word it is quotations from his work so um, yes was very important uh, for the Greek side. On the other hand, uh, Greek units like Metropolitan uh, Isidore, uh, he just uh, refused to listen uh, to the readings from Niles Cabasilas because, well, he said Cabasilas was a schismatic. He didn't want unity, and we don't want to hear those who didn't want unity. Very uh, charitable. Now, how about Gennadios Scalarios, who obviously was physically there? What was his role in council, if any? Well, uh, during the council, uh, Scalarios was uh, a lay person, so he was not uh, well a bishop, neither a cleric. Uh, he was he was a pro union at first. Well, at first everyone was pro union, but on the ground of the orthodox teaching. Later, many of the Greeks accepted union on the ground of the latent teaching and uh, Scalarius was one of uh, one of them but on the last day before signing the decree uh, he started to uh, feel himself uneasy he started to doubt and uh, he ran away he ran away he was not there when the decree was signed when the union was celebrated he was not in Florence he ran away and because he was a lay person, uh, he was not uh, well. He could run. Uh, he could run away. And he and he wouldn't be censured for doing so because he really didn't have a real say in it anyway. Yes. Uh, but um, after, after, after the council, after the council, uh, yes. Uh, well, he changed his mind uh, because he was a spiritual son of Saint Mark of Ephesus, after all, and he decided to be a, an Orthodox to protect the Orthodox teaching and well. Uh, after St. Mark died, he became the head of the Orthodox resistance and the greatest uh, theologian to refute latent errors, in my opinion. But it is, well, a completely other story, so to see. Well, and, and maybe we could do a follow-up on that someday. But let me ask this. Did, did Joseph of Constantinople really sign on to the council? Well, yes. Uh, he... Um, 
died before the signing of the decree, but before his death, uh, he left a testament in which uh, he explained that he accepts and, well, supports union. Uh, some writers tried to prove that uh, this testament was spurious, was false, but I think it is true because uh, Sylvester Seropoulos, uh well, tells us that uh, Petra really did accept Latin teaching and, well, Seropoulos was an anti-unionist, was opposed to the union, and still he says this, so it proves that, uh, that it is probably true. So you're not uncritically in favor of the orthodox side, you say, well, it really does look like in his last will testament he did accept union. Yes, it um, is, so, but he died before, before the actual signing of the union. Now, even though almost everyone in the Greek delegation officially signed it to the council, were they sincere? And how did the synods of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem respond to the council? Well, um, you see, uh, they signed, uh, Seropolo says a great thing, they signed before because the emperor told them to sign uh, without even thinking what they're, uh, they're signing. Uh, imagine that, yes, bishops signing something, not even thinking about what they are signing. Uh, I don't think that uh, most of them were sincere. Most of them repented and uh, refused to recognize their own uh, their own subscriptions uh, just after they left Florence. Uh, as soon as they came back uh, to Greece, to Byzantium, uh, they refused to recognize their own subscriptions, they repented, they said uh, that uh, they sold their faith and it was, uh, well, a shameful event for them, they repented, most of them. Uh, so, sincere, convinced unionists were like five, six bishops of all the Orthodox delegation. But we have to understand that the Orthodox delegation was not that big. There were lots of people, but uh, there were like two dozens of bishops. 24, as far as I remember, and uh, several of them died here in the council. Uh, speaking about uh, the other patriarchs, even before the council, when uh, all those um, discussions about legates, about representatives were conducted, the patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem said that they will only accept union if uh, uh, if the Latin novelties, if uh, the addition to the creed will not be approved. Uh, it was their strict and firm position. They said they, they, they will never accept union if uh, it includes addition to the creed. It was their cornerstone, it was their critical point. And because, uh, well, the union decree included uh, included uh, the addition to the creed. Um, the will of the Petras was not, uh, well, no, well, nothing was made as the Petras will. And so, uh, well, and, and so. Then, and synodically, they responded in 1443, correct? Yes, yes it, was, it was what I'm going to say. Well, uh, some bishops uh, signed the decree from, uh, well, like their representatives, like uh, uh, like Gregory Mamas subscribed the decree from the Alexandria, but the Patriarch of Alexandria was opposed, and so on. And in 1443, there was a Council of Jerusalem, there was a Council of Jerusalem which rejected union and uh, which affirmed that uh, the Orthodox Patriarch of the East will never accept union, uh, which includes addition to the creed and other Latin uh, novel dogmas. And uh, the Orthodox opposition in uh, Constantinople, like St. Gennadius Galerius and others, they always uh, used this rejection of the union by the Orthodox Patriarch as the main sign of not a communicity of the council, because the council not accepted by Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria can never be ecumenical. And, so, yeah, and just to emphasize, the, in the sixth session of the Council of Nicaea too, it explicitly says that you not only need all the patriarchs to accept the council, you would also yeah. need their, their synods to accept the council. 
uh, council yes. for it to be truly ecumenical. And in this case, not only did one of their legates, um, St. Mark of Ephesus, not accept this council, when their synods met, they also rejected the council. So yes. by no stretch of the imagination was the Council of Florence ever ecumenical. Yes, it is just uh, when uh, Catholic apologists try to say that uh, the Council of Florence was ecumenical is just, well, it is just lie because, well, no counts uh, because according to Byzantine and according uh, to the ecumenical councils, criteria of an ecumenical council affirmed by the seventh ecumenical council, only the council accepted by all the patriarchs can be called ecumenical, and Florence was not accepted. Now, my last question before we get into um, audience questions is that Council of Jerusalem 1443. Um, they accepted, I forget where he was from in Cappadocia or something, but they accepted one of the Greek bishops in uh, Constantinople's jurisdiction to then, yeah. to reordain new bishops that were anti-union. How did that work? Uh, yes, but, uh, well, I don't remember his name either. I need to check it and we don't have enough time, I think. Uh, it was Bishop of Cake. It was Bishop of Caesarea. I don't remember his name, something on A, uh, like Anthony, I don't remember. So it was Bishop of Caesarea. But uh, he. it seems that he never managed to do it because, uh, well, many of those territories was occupied by Turks. And Turks only accepted bishops who were approved by the emperor by the Constantinople, uh, by the emperor of the Constantinople. And the emperor did not uh, firm, did not accept the Orthodox bishops, he affirmed and accepted units. And so uh, this bishop of Caesarea went to Russia, to Moscow, and uh, there he, well, collected some money to help uh, him in his resistance and something else. And uh, the first translation of this uh, decree of the Council of Jerusalem of 1443 three was in this year in 1443 was translated into church slavonic in moscow so well his opposition was not so effective but uh, but it is documented in slavic documents too so it's yeah it sounds like he's very much like a stephen of dora or uh john of Thessal uh john of philadelphia character during the monofleet controversy like there he was tasked with you know, trying to make Orthodox bishops back where there were heretical yes. bishops, but it just, you know, it didn't pan out, yes. um, at least in the short term. All right, so let me get to some audience questions. If you don't know, we will just keep going. Uh, so, someone asked, because um, I can't pronounce Burr, Brudax, or whatever that is, could you say something about the Scotus defense of the Filioque? Because I don't know much about Scotism. Do you have anything to say? Well, uh, I have, but I think it is, uh, well, it is a uh, a too complicated question to discuss uh, in five or four minutes, and I'm not sure that I can speak about it in English without preparation. But, uh, well, I think that there is a certain trouble that, uh, well, nowadays people just uh, imagine, just invent an explanation for the uh, they just like it and say it is the Scottist uh, interpretation of the Philoque. But it is not Scottist, it's just what this person imagined on the spot. Uh, it is a, a very widespread problem. Uh, well, and in Florence it was not uh, used at all. All the opponents of St. Mark was, well, they were... They're all Thomists. They were Thomists, yes. All right, and so the, the doctrine of Florence can't be conflated with Scotism because what they explained to the Filioque had to yes, do with with the people they were using, like uh, Thomas Aquinas. Yes. All right. And so here's a question. Is it fair to say then that Florence dogmatized a causality of the Son in relation to the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit? Yes, exactly. It was what is said in the conciliar decree. It is said that, oh, let me read it one, one second. Uh, a moment. Uh, well, 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 well. While he's looking up, guys, last call yeah. for questions. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> sun, the sun should be signified according to the Greeks in Greek uh, terms, indeed as cause, 
and according to the latent, as principle of the subsistence of the Holy Spirit, just like the Father. Substance is, uh, well, in Orthodox language, hypostatical existence of the Holy Spirit. So, right. yes, it is exactly what was being tested. Um, how about this question, if it works? The, did the Emperor forbid St. Mark from mentioning St. Gregory Palmas and thus the eternal manifestation and the energy essence distinction during the Council? Well, um, yes, it was forbidden to mention Gregory Palama, uh, Palam, Palamas. Yes, sorry. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. And uh, this question, this whole question of essence and energies was forbidden to discuss. Why? Is true. So, uh, they, in the end, uh, after the council itself, uh, the Greeks accepted uh, the latent teaching about this question, uh, were ready to accept. They did not accept it formally, but they were ready to accept it. Uh, why it was forbidden? Because it is a big and a complicated question, and the emperor was sure that if they start to discuss it, it will ruin their any hope of union they ever had. And so, so it's too big of an issue. Did the, so the decree of Florence, though, did not actually address created grace versus the energy essence distinction. Yes, uh, the, it's it, just it, what uh, it's what the unionists accepted after the council. Yes, yes, and uh, well, uh, I think that uh, probably uh, the other reason, as uh, Father Christian Kepper says, that uh, Scotists were more compatible, were more conciliar, was more warmer ready to compromise with Palamites than Thomists, and uh, so there, were, there was no unity among the Latins themselves. But it is just, um, well, it is just uh, guessed, it is not proven, I think. All right, quick question. Do you think Bessarion and Isidore Kiev were really convinced of Roman Catholic arguments or no? I think Bessarion uh, definitely was. He definitely was because even before the council, he has he he had his doubts. Uh, well, in respect of Palamism, he had his doubts, and I think that really he was convinced by Roman Catholic arguments. But speaking of uh, Isidore, I think that he was more of a patriotic man. Uh, he did not care that much about theology. I can't uh, explain it more uh, in detail now. But I think that for him, what was important is that the union. Uh, was achieved. He just was ready to do anything to achieve union, even if it included uh, dogmatic changes. All right, and this is the last question. It's addressed to me, and I'll be very frank, and you could interject. Did the Latin fathers teach the Filioque, meaning the priests and fathers? Um, they, my answer is no, they did not teach the Florence doctrine of the Filioque. They taught the doctrine that St. Maximus was talking about, which was rejected by Florence. Um, should we read Latin Fathers through the lens of an orthodox understanding? My answer is yes. Do you have anything you'd like to add, Peter? Uh, well, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think that uh, Latin Fathers, exactly, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Leo the Great, there are not so many of them. And I think that their teaching is not that of uh, Thomas Aquinas or the Council of Arms. Definitely, it is not their, their teaching. Uh, I think that it is possible to interpre uh, interpret them through the orthodox lens. And, uh, well, we cannot be sure that it is exactly what they meant. St. Uh, Gennadius Hilarius said that we may interpret uh, that they definitely did not teach as uh, modern Latins do, but what exactly they teach, we can be sure, but we can interpret them through the Orthodox lens, even if it seems a bit strained. I think that uh, his answer is the best. So Yes, because we always that, harmonize the fathers. That's what the saints yes, do. They always harmonize yes, the yes. fathers. He, he said that we should do it even if it is a bit strained and it can seem a bit strained for someone. And, and it's great that the saint is honest about that, that it's not always harmonizing the fathers is not always the easiest thing to do, but it's better to presume they all agree than to say there's these two separate count, camps that totally disagree. Yes, yes um, but of course, but, of course he, uh, but later Salero said that even if uh, some of them add on this question, it does not destroy the harmony of fathers in the consensus party. Okay. All right, so before we're out of time, because we only have maybe a minute, 30 seconds, 
Um, my plug is orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate for the churches in Cambodia to support the Moscow Patriarchate parishes in Sinokville and Phnom Penh. Please, 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 if this has blessed you, support those parishes. There's a link down below. It's very important because I will be not asking for money for about a month. Um, and Peter, what are your plugs? How can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, uh, I have social media. Uh, I have Twitter and I have uh, a Russian social media contact. Uh, so <clears throat> if people want to contact me, they can just write me. Or if you see, the little beauty is here. So <laughs> what a cutie. <laughs> just write me and I'll be glad to answer any questions. And I really hope we will be able to talk with you once or maybe more times more <clears throat> to discuss Gennadius Hilarius and uh, the orthodox opposition to the Union after the Council or something of that kind. It will be a great pleasure for me. Yes, by, by God's grace, there will be there will be a sequel and it will cover Gennadius Scalarios. It will also uh, cover uh, what happens between 1440, uh, 1439 and 1453. Um, that being said, I just want to emphasize what happened today is big, big, big for you, Peter. Not big maybe scholarly wise, but in the apologetics world. And prepare yourself to be attacked rhetorically. You're safe in Russia. Um, and Russia, thankfully, has a good, strong nuclear deterrent. You're safe. But you're going to be attacked rhetorically because this interview today has taken down so much English level scholarship and so much English Roman Catholic apologetics that they will not be able to recover from this and expect numerous response videos where they're going to try to listen to scholars with out of context questions to refute you, which they can't because anyone who reads the minutes of these councils has the answers right in front of them, which is why I encourage everyone who's sincere about these questions. You have to read the minutes of these councils. That's pretty much, I'm the English specialist in this, that I've read all these things and all their minutes in English. And by God's grace, Peter, there's enough money in it for you to one day make your Russian translation in English. So uh, may, may God bless you in, in your present endeavor. And I jealously hope for future endeavors that at least someone will pick up the pen in English and translate your stuff. But just prepare yourself. This has been a tremendous, tremendous interview. So I thank you on behalf of the audience. Okay, uh, thank you, Craig, and uh, may God help us all. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. God bless you all. Have a great day. We're going to say goodbye to Peter, and uh, I will end the show as I end all of them by quoting uh, Jesus to rock, fight to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you all. Have a great day. Goodbye.